What's the secret to helping your child succeed in school? I'm Christina Salerno. Coming up, we'll show you how two statewide groups are meeting that challenge. In one case, it's the parents who are going back to school themselves. We all like a say in where our tax dollars go, but what happens when it comes to funding for public schools? I'm Jim Finnerty. In recent years, California state funding has changed significantly, impacting different school districts in very different ways. We'll take a look at two districts where new laws have met a dramatic shift in how they approach education. Students and teachers will tell you that learning doesn't happen only in the classroom. Field trips can inspire young people even away from their desks. I'm Sarah Gardner. We'll take you to one school in Northern California where students gain a better understanding of agriculture thanks to some visiting cows. It's all coming up on Inside California Education. Funding for Inside California Education is made possible by... Since 1985, the California Lottery has raised more than $30 billion for our public schools. It's a modest amount after dividing it up to California's 1,100 public school districts from kindergarten through high school, as well as community colleges, UC and CSU campuses. Still, these funds help attract quality teachers, provide classroom equipment, and keep art and music programs alive. With caring teachers, committed administrators, and active parents, every public school student can realize their dreams. The California Lottery, imagine the possibilities. The Stewart Foundation, improving life outcomes for young people through education. Additional funding for Inside California Education is made possible by these organizations supporting public education. Thanks for joining us on Inside California Education. If you're the parent of a school-aged child, you'd like your youngster to be attentive in class, have a good attitude about finishing their homework, and doing their best on every test. Any number of studies show that an important part of student success can be tied to parents who take an active interest in their child's education. But just how do you do that? Well, let's take a look at two unique programs helping parents to better connect with teachers and schools. Hey, Ms. Hammond, this is Kate Kukiko. I am Adrian's resource specialist teacher. How are you today? These two Sacramento teachers are role-playing a phone call to a student's home. One is playing the teacher and one is playing the parent. Are you coming because she's having problems at school? Is she making bad choices? It's a phone call they'll soon be making to real parents as part of the parent-teacher home visit project. It's all about developing a more personal parent-teacher relationship, one that goes beyond your typical back-to-school night or parent-teacher conference. As teachers, we step out of our comfort zone and we meet our families where they are, in their home, we like to say on their turf, so to speak. Um, and that totally shifts the power. Shout out to me. What did you come up with? Lisette LeMay is the coordinator for the Home Visit Project in Sacramento. The program started here in 1998 and has since spread to more than 400 schools nationwide. LeMay leads a three-hour training session for teachers who agree to do home visits with their students' families. Typically, we engage families by kind of telling them when we need them to come see us at the school site. Under our model, it's totally voluntary, so the family can opt into a visit. We offer different days and times, so again, there's some power and choice. When would you like the visit to happen? Great, so before school Monday, so uh, Mr. Overall and I will show up probably around uh, 8 o'clock. One of the biggest hurdles teachers face, convincing parents the home visit is friendly. We hear a lot of fear and concern about why is the school really coming. There's a lot of institutional distrust right now between school and home. I've had parents uh, maybe worry that the home visit is about something negative, like I want to go in and um, tell them about how bad their kid's doing or um, talk about grades. Once we set it up as a positive reason we're coming with wanting to get to know the student, wanting to get to know the families. Parents get more comfortable more quickly. Hi. 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 Good. How are you? Good. Good to you? see you. Can we come in? Yeah. I saw them get to my house yeah. and 
at the beginning, um, I felt sort of, yeah, nervous, and and then I I actually, I actually at after um, I felt comfortable. We were having a conversation with my mom and me. Huh? You like math and science? Yeah. Is that why you wanted to go for the science? Yeah. Yeah, and hey. engineering. <laughs> and, and engineering? Yeah. Oh, so good. And emotional. It's a different experience. But we felt happy, both of us. For Jose, in class, he was always very quiet. Um, he, would spoke when, he would speak when spoken to. Um, but beyond that, I really didn't know who he was, and I just wanted to get to know him a little bit better to see if that would then translate to his academics in the classroom. When we went over to his house, um, he was a completely different child. So what about engineering do you like? Um, architecture. Yeah? Is that something you're interested in for the future, like a job? Hoy platicamos más cosas que de lo normal, cosas que no sabía. Los maestros se enteraron cosas que no sabían de, de él. So, conocimos, nos conocimos más. Program leaders say the home visit model can be adapted to any school, as long as it sticks to what they call five core values. So the first is it always has to be voluntary for everybody. The second is people need to be trained and compensated for their time because it's outside of their regular day. The third is that we don't target kids, so we're going to visit everybody, right? So if we can't visit everyone, then we're intentionally doing a cross-section. The fourth is we send people out in pairs because we want them to reflect on the learning they had. And then finally, it's relational. If nothing else happens but somebody shows up with their heart open and talks about hopes and dreams, it's an amazing home visit, and we're fine. Research shows this model is working. A study by John Hopkins University found that students whose families received a home visit were more likely to read at or above grade level and had 24% fewer absences. I used to be quiet and now, now I I didn't use to raise my hand and actually answer questions that she asked to the class, and now I do, to that home visit. He was going from lower grades and now is completely passing in my classes. The greatest benefit for me is to be able to truly, authentically get to know each and every child that's sitting in the classroom with me. There isn't anything better than that. While teachers are the ones taking the lead in the home visit project, a different program puts the parents in the driver's seat. Over the course of a few months, parents learn just about everything there is to know about the school system and how they can put it to work for their families. This is a very, very important day. We this graduation ceremony in Pomona, California the is not for the kids in the room, it is, it's um, for the parents. Uh, it's to be recognized that you would put forth your time in order to uh, better your parenting skills. These parents just completed a seven-week course called School Smarts, developed by the California Parent Teacher Association. The course teaches parents the nuts and bolts of education. Everything from how to best communicate with your child's principal to how the California public school system is funded. The parents are learning um, during these sessions. The parents are learning about um, the types of academics, um, the uh, curriculum that the students are being exposed to. Um, things in the state of California have changed drastically recently. Here in Northern California, parents meet at their local school for evening sessions once a week. The sessions are held in both English okay. and Spanish. Okay, bienvenidos otra vez y muchas gracias por tomar su tiempo en venir a... But this action plan does not have to be um, large goals only. It can be little teeny tiny goals. I mean, parents at this session are right, learning right? how to I mean, create an action plan like that, to enact change in schools, change like a new lunch to. menu or so an not, altered drop-off schedule. Can literally be for Every project, program or initiative requires setting goals and creating an action plan. As a first-time parent in a school, you do not know how the school system works. You do not know how to approach the teachers or the principals. Um, even just what's going on in, in education. For parents like Zenobia Dimas, her confidence grew each week as she went through the program. Para mí fue lo que yo descubrí a través de este programa, a través de estas clases, eh, que yo tenía una capacidad dentro de mí que, que si yo me proponía hacer algo, yo lo podría lograr.
el poder estar este, participando en las juntas como, como madre, el poder venir cuando le iban a dar un certificado, yo estaba ahí todo el tiempo, cuando tenía que hablar con un maestro estaba ahí también, cuando miré que estaba él bajando de, de calificaciones tenía que venir y preguntarle a la maestra qué estaba pasando. I think every parent wants their child to succeed. And the more that you're engaged with your children in terms of their schooling, I think that your child will succeed just by your presence being there. The program has benefited my family, my kids, especially because I have the knowledge now. I know more things. I know who to contact. I know where to go if I need help or my child needs help. The Parent Teacher Association began back in 1897 when a group called the National Congress of Mothers gathered supporters in Washington, D.C. to take an active interest in public education. Over the next 100 years, the National PTA was instrumental in several school issues, including the creation of kindergarten classes, child labor laws, arts education, and hot lunch programs. Let's talk about your tax dollars where that money goes, how much is distributed on a per pupil basis, and what kind of a say a community has in spending those dollars really depends on a complex set of factors. But the rules have changed. Let's take a look at two examples in two districts and see how those changes have impacted them. Uh, Jimmy, did you get what is the role of the oyster in the ocean ecosystem? Uh, they filter the water. Yeah, they filter water, right? California has made a commitment to ensure that public school students have the physical and emotional ability to tackle the challenges of a classroom education. We provide um, breakfast in the classroom, we provide lunch, and sometimes even supper for students. Um, and a lot of times, again, this is the only meal that they might get in a day. And so it's really important that students have nutrition in order to be able to learn. Those challenges, however, must often be addressed with a different approach to resources in less affluent districts. The Merced City School District in the state's Central Valley is one of those. With poverty come limited experiences and opportunities, especially for our youngest students. Not every student may have gone to preschool. Not every student comes to us with proficiency of the English language. And because of that, um, trying to Um, ensure that all kids achieve academically as well as socially is a challenge for us. So look at this. Groups of two. How many groups of two do you have? Nine. In addition, some districts, such as Oakland's Unified School District, face the realities of urban crime as well as socioeconomic disparities. To combat these challenges, the state of California made the most significant change to education funding in decades. The Local Control Funding Formula, or LCFF, became law in 2013. It gives districts much more discretion in how funds from the legislature can be spent. It's focused on equity, which for us means fairness. It's recognizing that in order for students to meet the same high bar that we have for students across the state of California, Some students are going to need more, and some cities have higher concentrations of those students that need more support. For the last 40 years, legislators in Sacramento largely told school districts how to spend their money. Funds were delivered to districts through dozens of strict categoricals. Those categoricals are now gone, replaced with eight priority areas, such as providing quality teachers and safe environments, and implementing common core standards in English, math, and science. Each school district gets a base grant per pupil, plus more money for every disadvantaged student. The goal? Level the playing field. The state uh, really uh, came together with this new uh, funding formula and tried to remove a lot of the, the categorical restrictions, and that has really made a difference, which has allowed us to focus on the needs of students and really also try to get as many decisions made as close to students as possible. The way it's, our system's working now, and it may One mandate of this new program is requiring but, um, each district to create a Local Control and Accountability Plan, or LCAP, with input from students, teachers, and parents. 
as a single mom, you're working and you're not always able to be at the school. So a lot of times there's work that's going on that you don't know about. And so you may not appreciate all the work that's going on because you don't see the work that's going on. But being involved in the LCAP has been able to give me that opportunity to see all the work that's going on and that all these educators really do want the same thing and they want what's best for your children. Our main focus are kids. So whether I'm talking to an organizer, whether I'm talking to someone in the district or a parent, we're talking about the kids. But districts like Oakland recognize that they are still catching up to school budget numbers that they once enjoyed before the nation's recent recession. What it's done is it's actually brought us back um, to our funding levels that we're, that we're experiencing four or five years ago. So we haven't quite, um, we're not quite receiving the same amount of funding that we once did, um, but we are, you know, coming closer. To deal with all of these challenges, there is another aspect to the LCFF funding. In districts like Merced and Oakland, higher rates of poverty, children in foster care, and students with limited English language skills make the districts eligible for supplemental dollars. That money can be used in a variety of ways to address issues from absenteeism to remedial lessons to student welfare. We have kids who have come in and they don't recognize any letters or letter sounds and um, so we immediately need to begin intervention to get those kids caught up even at the kinder level. Oakland also receives supplemental dollars in part because the community is considered a safe haven for children who have immigrated from third world or war-torn countries, often by themselves. Many of them have experienced rape, robbery. Um, many of them are coming al alone to this country without having any English, having very little money. So we need to provide services for these students to be successful, not only in academics, but also to make sure that they have things like food, shelter, um, and also just the emotional counseling support that they might need to overcome some of the trauma. Parents in these districts see this new approach to funding as critical to giving their youngsters a better start in life. So my school, Hoover Elementary School, I think got like about around $50,000, $45,000, With that money, we're going to be able to buy more electronics devices like iPads. Did you say fully nomadic? The new funding formula affects every one of the 1,000 school districts in the state of California. And the ability to access those additional funds to tackle significant community issues means that districts like Merced and Oakland can help students receive a quality and equitable education. We're going to ensure that every child is going to be able to succeed. We have to provide the additional supports that are necessary to make that happen. And when we do that, all of us benefit. I think it's extremely important that um, across the state that we say every child is expected to graduate and we're going to do whatever it takes to make sure those students get what they need to be successful. California's first public school opened in San Francisco in 1848 and students were required to pay tuition to attend. But the school didn't last long. Word soon came that gold could be found in the hills and the school's young pupils disappeared practically overnight. Two years later, another San Francisco school opened, but this time it was free. The school would become the basis for the first city school system in California. Still ahead on Inside California Education, you could call it cattle in the classroom as students learn more about agriculture in their lives. But first, a little Education 101 as we ask an expert, in the age of hacking, how is student data protected in California? Hacking is one of the issues that IT, or information technology people in schools and districts, it's probably the most challenging. It's what keep them, keeps them up at night. Things that districts can do and schools do do is uh, set up established firewalls. And a firewall is like a traffic cop. It basically controls the data that moves between networks, the information that comes from the outside internet into the local district. The other thing that districts do is they set up uh, virus protection programs, very similar to what users might have at home. 
it's also the responsibility of users to be much more aware. And that's one of the things that parents can do to help their children, is really to help them understand what are inappropriate files, things that shouldn't be downloaded, websites that shouldn't be clicked on. And the same thing happens in schools. If a user, a student, or a teacher clicks on an infected file that gets through the virus protection program, it can have disastrous effects. One of the latest things now out there is something called ransomware. If a user clicks on what's called a ransomware, or sometimes malware file, and downloads it to their computer, it can infect the entire network. And then the data on the network becomes infected, can't be used until either they pay, the district pays the person who put that ransomware uh, into the district, or until they go back to older files. Fortunately though, the state legislature uh, in 2014 passed several laws that stipulate that districts must have ironclad agreements with vendors on how they will protect the data. School field trips to places like the local farmer's market, a ranch or a farm, can provide children with the opportunity to learn where their food comes from. But sometimes, the farm comes directly to campus. Let's tell you about one California school program teaching students more about the dairy industry with the help of a couple of traveling cows. Fields of green dotted with cattle quietly grazing. A bucolic image of rural American life. But nowadays, one rarely seen by most people. In fact, many modern school children may not even know where milk and other dairy products come from and the role they play in a healthy, nutritious diet. And despite the large number of cows in the Golden State, most residents never have the chance to interact up close with our bovine friends. That is, unless the cows come to you. And that's what these kids are experiencing at this elementary school in Rancho Cordova, outside Sacramento. This is one of six mobile dairy classrooms traveling the state, bringing the farm to the classroom for nearly a half million youngsters each year. Are you ready to meet a special guest? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Today, the kids are meeting Snickers, a five-year-old, 1,500-pound Holstein cow. Then, the highlight, a chance to see and pet a calf. Instructor Kimberly Human says she's been managing these kid and cow encounters for five years, meetings that never get old. Is, I think it's absolutely perfect for me to actually see the light bulb go off that they can see a connection between an actual dairy cow and the milk that is in their cafeteria and that agriculture provides all of the food that they eat when it comes to all five food groups. It's all right there in front of them. I think it was amazing. The first time I ever seen a cow. It was really cool. We saw a calf and we saw a mama cow. She had two babies, except um, she's still pregnant with one. What was your favorite part of the whole thing? Petting the little baby calf. It was so cute. For these students, it's more than just their first cow encounter. Beyond discovering where milk comes from, they're also learning some basics about animal biology and agriculture. We learned that it has one giant big stomach and it has four pockets inside of it. So, so it's like one, two, three, four. I've already heard this is the best day ever of school. It's really connected to the classroom and what we've been teaching over the past month. Um, we've been focusing on a farm unit and this really connects agriculture to the classroom um, in a real setting for them. Why is there veins popping out? Because it has milk in them. The Dairy Council of California actually started this cow on campus program way back in the 1930s. Over the years, they've integrated their agricultural information with other classroom subjects, including language arts, math, and science. So we're learning what nutrition is, what does that look like to be a healthy eater, and then the children are also writing about what they've learned, what they've experienced. So typically you'll see a teacher take one lesson and apply it across the curriculum so that the students are able to show what they know and they understand. Besides the hands-on learning opportunities for students, this mobile dairy program also benefits people still working in agriculture. 
who want to show they share much of the same values as those who use their products. I think we've done a good job across agriculture trying to get that message out, but we can never do enough trying to connect where food comes from. I think we just need to get more classrooms out there. You know, this is something I think every young child should experience, and not just in California, but across the country. Okay, let me hear a big round of applause, go. When the petting is done and all the questions answered, it's time for Kimberly to secure mom and baby cow back inside the trailer. Then it's on to the next school and the next group of kids, teachers, and even parents. A chance for them to reconnect to and learn about the land, even if for only a day. That's going to do it for this edition of Inside California Education. If you'd like more information about the program, just log on to our website, insidecaled.org. We have video from all of our shows, and you can connect with us on social media as well. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Inside California Education. Hi. Hi. Hello. How are you? Good. Good to see you. Can we come in? Yeah. Shout out to me. What did you come up with? How many groups of two do you Funding for Inside California Education is made possible by... Since 1985, the California Lottery has raised more than $30 billion for our public schools. It's a modest amount after dividing it up to California's 1,100 public school districts from kindergarten through high school, as well as community colleges, UC and CSU campuses. Still, these funds help attract quality teachers, provide classroom equipment, and keep art and music programs alive. With caring teachers, committed administrators, and active parents, every public school student can realize their dreams. The California Lottery, imagine the possibilities. The Stewart Foundation, improving life outcomes for young people through education. Additional funding for Inside California Education is made possible by these organizations supporting public education.